of us believe that the Middle Ages was a period of violence, misery and obscurantism, of poverty and squalor, an age where mercy was meager. An age where poor people had no more than a morsel of bread to eat if they were lucky, while nobles and their fair women would be feasting to excess. In fact, the period was not so bleak. In Europe, the Middle Ages brought the development of medicine, architecture, masonry, algebra, and love of cooking. Between the 10th and the 15th centuries, our ancestors became enlightened consumers. They invented disassociated or combined diets, regional recipes, and even printed cookbooks. And they handed down these skills and knowledge to us. This is the year of our Lord, 1427. Squire Martin observed his fattened geese very carefully. In the Middle Ages, master cooks were called squire. The local lord or knight trusted them totally. What's more, the title of squire held prestige. After years of loyal service, only squires could hope to be ennobled. Squire Martin knows that the road to nobility will be a long one. Meanwhile, awaiting the moment to prepare a succulent dish of goose for his lord, Squire Martin commands a small troop of grill chefs, bellows workers, vegetable growers and wine specialists. He has to pay great care to his lord's health and appetite and that of his guests. He also needs to have diplomatic qualities. He knows the delicacies of successful feasts can influence political decisions and create alliances. There is indeed an art to becoming a squire. Well, a good trencher, and here we're really talking about somebody who in the time would be called a scalco in French, an écuyer, uh, was a very important person for any kind of banquet because he had to supervise the whole proceedings and also to respect uh, a series of, of uh, symbolical uh, steps in, in this. Therefore, for example, the right-hand side of an animal was import more important than a left-hand side, the front part was better considered better than the back part and therefore in cutting the animal up and then serving it this was a way of then respecting also the hierarchies. To be a master cook one also had to be an excellent organizer and historian of cookery. Above all, you had to have a gift for improvisation. You had to make do with day-to-day -day availability. This morning, the catch was excellent. These fillets of salmon will be perfect for the base of salmon recipe. This was a luxury dish, reserved for the privileged only. Freshwater catch were extremely precious. Poor could not fish in the rivers because the rivers didn't belong to them. I mean, there's a problem there. Also, that a lot of the fish didn't necessarily come from what we would consider today wild sources, but rather from lakes, artificial lakes and cisterns. In any case, what is certain is that the price was always extremely high, and therefore it was a consumption model that was really aimed at the upper classes. The poor did not eat fish or in any case ate very, very little fish. Squire Martin's secret to making this baste of salmon worthy of his lord's table and appeal to his host, the Duke of Rodez, is using lemon juice. 
Absorbed by the still rosy fillets, the zest of lemon will give the dish a slightly sweet note. The bellows workers, the first link in the cooking chain, had to have strong arms and be able to put up with intense heat while handling frying pans of this size and weight. This method was still better than using an oven. It took much less time and the result was astounding. The fillets are glazed to perfection in less than five minutes. Pour deux pas. D'accord. Prépare des des branches de laurier que tu vas venir disposer autour des filets en décoration. In the Middle Ages, sophisticated cooking was not within everyone's reach. The immense majority of the population had to be satisfied with little. Around the year 1000 AD, dwellings of the common folk were built in the shadow of the wooden fortifications of the local castle. Stone castles had not yet been conceived, nor had the notion of building a kitchen area. To avoid perishing from suffocation, cooking was done in the open air, in a houle, a clay pot, which was ideal for stewing, then reheating very rudimentary dishes. We can only imagine the food of the common people of this period, yet they made up 90% of the population. We do know that daily meals were based largely on cereals. The population had to manage a very fragile balance in terms of nutrition. With a bad harvest, their food consumption took a blow. During the 10th and 11th centuries, famines were still common. Rural life for medieval peasants was that of serfs, quasi-slaves, totally dependent on their lord, possessing no land, then committing the greater part of their harvest to their masters, who became increasingly demanding as their warring practices dragged on, indebting them. The only solution to improving daily meals was to poach, to venture into the forests and lands of the local lord. Often, Adding a morsel of meat to one stew ran the risk of going to the gallows. Between the year 1000 and 1400, obtaining one's pittance was a daily concern for peasants, for beggars, and even travelling entertainers like the great medieval French poet François Villon. We can imagine him here in a village, neighbouring Orléans, on an evening in 1460, earning his crust by chanting to his public. Meat on a spit, a gourd of broth, grilled pike, but for the poor are like me who get a nothing, for the grace of God, grant us our pittance. Fortunately, a capitulary dating from the 9th century, decreed by Charlemagne, established as law that travellers must be granted at least shelter, fire and some water. In inns across Europe, just as we see here in the historical park of Acheon, close to Alphen in the Netherlands, where time seems to have stood still since the 14th century, musicians and bards perform to satisfy their needs in food and drink. Here in northern Europe, this Minnesänger, a name for a troubadour, is welcomed with a cup of Hippocras. This was the most popular beverage of the time and was made from young red wine, sweetened with honey and infused with cinnamon and ginger. Wine consumption during the Middle Ages was enormous compared with today's standards. 
historians estimate that two to three litres per person per day was common. However, wines were always young. They seldom exceeded five to six degrees alcohol content so as to ensure their virtue as an antiseptic. In the Middle Ages, it was recommended to add wine to one's beverage of water. Wine enthusiasts are still curious to learn exactly how wine was crushed in those times. Here in this tapestry in the Museum of the Middle Ages in Paris, you can see two distinct methods of producing wine. Firstly, crushing grapes with your foot, the mergout and most esteemed technique. Then, by mechanical crushing, producing an inferior wine since the must was also fermented. This produced a more tinted, thicker and darker wine, which was destined for the lower classes. There was clearly a class distinction by the type of wine produced. With or without the Mergout method, François Villon would have amused his audiences by singing the Ballad of Times Past. And his pittance would be in the form of a good bowl of soup and a cup of dark wine. To make a good soup, you need bread, and that is the business of bakers. In the Middle Ages, they were mostly women and much sought after, especially when the next batch was required. Great gossipers, as they needed quantities of dough, they invented sayings that we still use today. Earn your bread. What an ordeal, like going without bread, or you stole the bread from my plate. The staple element of medieval times was bread. Wheat, rye, bran were used to make bread from coarse black to refined white, depending on one's social position. At least in the Middle Ages, so you have three different kinds of bread. The most, uh, the whitest bread is the one that was consumed by the rich people. Then you had a sort of middle grade bread that was consumed by somewhat less fortunate people where there was mixed in a certain amount of chaff and that made it a somewhat darker bread. And then finally you had a third variety that was made for the servants and for the dogs because the dogs too were fed this and that had a lot of chaff and made it into a very very dark bread in kingdoms throughout europe the color and grade of bread was appreciated differently however white bread was universally considered the best bread it's already precociously true that in 14th century Italy, uh, most people were eating white bread. In fact, even during problem years, uh, there were all kinds of riots to make sure that people managed to get their white bread. While the oven is heating up, the bakers finish the preparation. They fashion a series of small balls of dough to make round rolls, and these are destined for the soup. Whatever the season, this small, firm roll is placed in the bottom of the bowl. Broth is poured over the roll, making for a thicker and more nutritious soup. Dinner was served early in the Middle Ages, around 5 p.m., in relation to the daylight available. Poorer people could not turn up their noses at this dish of soup the leftovers of which were so often reheated for the next meal. Only the color of soup changed according to the season. At the end of autumn and winter, often periods of food shortages, soup was brown or dark in color, made from peas or beans. With the return of spring, soup became lighter in color as onions and nettles were used, sometimes with a cloud of milk. In summer, soup could be of a rich green color, the ingredients being a range of vegetables. In any event, be it for soup, 
or to accompany any other dish, bread was always present at medieval tables, especially when it came to tasting a good chunk of meat. Sliced in two, bread was transformed into a plate, then meat was placed on it, and there wasn't a crumb wasted. And if the calendar permitted, quail would be relished. Whether one was rich or poor, fast days were instituted by the very powerful Catholic Church, and they were very strictly observed. Days of abstinence when one could not eat meat represented approximately a third of the calendar year, totaling 140, 150 and even 160 days a year. There was no single rule since local churches followed local rules in the Middle Ages. We can say that at least a third of the year was devoted to days of Lent or abstinence. Today, dietitians prescribe a similar regime. By disassociating fatty foods and carbohydrates, our ancestors practice one of the healthiest diets possible. And what is more, they believe that a healthy life paved the way to salvation. They walked a lot. Every year, some 500,000 pilgrims, a huge figure of the 13th and 14th century, took to the roads of Saint-Jacques-de-Compostela. To traverse the Franco-Spanish frontier, they were obliged to climb Roncevaux Pass that cut across a section of the Pyrenees Mountains. When these pious pilgrims, men, women and children, found themselves climbing such arduous slopes, all the while observing abstinence, refusing to eat meat, they believed they were truly on the path to redemption. For these pilgrims, as for all good Christians, such conditions, deemed by the church, were accepted. Alternating between days with a meal of fatty food, animal protein, and days of abstinence such as Lent was common practice. I believe it was quite natural to tune the mind and the spirit to such alternations in food during the Middle Ages. The collective medieval mindset was conditioned by down-to-earth habits. For example, in certain medieval cities during Lent, the corporation of butchers, the Becai, simply stopped selling meat and offered fish. I don't believe that medieval society minded switching between fasting and meat-eating days. On foot for several months, pilgrims needed nutrition rich in calories. Bread, cheese and especially almonds became the staple food for them. Dried fruits were for young children. They were candies or sweets of the time. For adolescents, they were fashioned into a paste with or without milk. These sweets became one of the most appreciated snacks of medieval meals. Butter had yet to be invented. To disguise the taste of bread gone stale, lard or animal fat was used as a spread. Such treats were subject to self-denial on Fridays prior to Easter or religious interdictions. These excesses were of course curtailed on Fridays during the 40-day fasting period prior to Easter in observance of the crucifixion of Christ or when the church authorities ordained penitents and regulations. To get round such obligations, good Christians needed an exemption. The church distributed exemptions with parsimony. Only pregnant women, children, the sick and members of the clergy benefited. Clearly there is a problem about the conception of, of uh, monks in the Middle Ages because the records that we have seem to show that many of them did not follow the prescriptions that they were supposedly meant to follow. And so when the monk tried to 
uh, escape from the way that he was supposed to eat. He was actually ending up consuming a kind of forbidden fruit, but certainly also a very prestigious kind of uh, food. This he managed to do either by declaring that he was sick or being considered sick, or because he had some kind of a prestigious role in the convent that made him into a, a consumer of meat. To continue enjoying God's good produce, monks used to cheat a little. When they were not committed to Lent, they deemed they needed hearty meals to be able to do their job well. Results from studies on some Cistercian monastery registries dating from the 14th century confirm that the regime of monks comprised 3,500 to 4,000 calorie intakes a day, more than twice the amount that common people consumed. In the Middle Ages, monasteries and convents housed small farms and fabulous gardens. Production vastly exceeded daily needs. Some lay people, starting with pilgrims, were allowed to share a portion of the crop. The reputation of the monks grew after such benevolent acts. Food production of monasteries varied greatly according to the region. Vegetables, fruits, beer in Northern Europe, wines and cheeses in the south. Each congregation had its preferred dishes. Here, in Roncevaux Abbey on the Franco-Spanish border, a key stopover for pilgrims along the Pyrenean Passage, a tasty used cheese became the hallmark of the religious order. The cheese was believed to give pilgrims the strength needed to reach Saint-Jacques de Compostela, more than two weeks distant on foot. Contrary to what we learn, our ancestors were very aware of a balanced diet. They loved dining and feasting, but rarely to excess. Life was short at the time, for men around 40 years on average. Hygiene and a sound diet did more than candles and prayers in a church to allow people to live at least that long. The belief that a good diet ensured good health was widespread. Good food had the virtue of developing our natural defenses to fight diseases. We think much alike today. Certain foods were also believed to be cures. An appropriate diet made it possible to fight a particular disease. This belief was so strong that prescribed foods became grounds for medical practice, a tradition that has lapsed today. In the Middle Ages, regiments like the Tequinum Sanitatis prescribed all foods as being medicine. Herbs, spices, vegetables, certain meats were seriously taken as cures, just as our pharmaceutical treatments are today. This medical theory was inherited from practices in ancient Greece, later adopted by Islamic doctors. All diseases were believed to erupt from imbalances of bodily humors. Cures could be prescribed by activating or reducing the state of these humors by an appropriate regimen of foods corresponding with hot, cold, dry and wet types. Les fiévreux, ceux qui avaient des fièvres, 
Feverish patients suffering from pathologies like malaria, common in the Mediterranean areas, were treated with a salad regimen, as salads were cold. For an everyday diet, salads were strictly proscribed. They were considered too cold, dangerous for the health, too long to digest. For fevers, however, salads were the cure. Medical precepts developed by the Salerno School of Medicine, then by medical faculties in Bologna, Montpellier and Cambridge, were translated into popular jargon using rhymes. Saying such as, milk after wine is venom, wine after milk is welcome. After fresh fruit, good wine is to boot, or even uncooked veal and raw poultry make for many death a reality. The search for balanced diets in the medieval world was not restricted to regimens alone. Healthy eating meant procuring fresh produce. A food handling hygiene was also strictly observed. This market in the town of Dinan in Brittany is a replica of its medieval predecessor. It was built by ardent enthusiasts of the Middle Ages and gives us a clear picture of conditions in those times. All kinds of stalls stand side by side. An arms manufacturer, a seller of herbs, of vegetables, a butcher and fishmonger. All food mongers had to respect precise rules, especially for food conservation. Take herring, for example. The North Sea abounded in herring. In Europe, it was the source of protein during periods of penitence. In 1493, the knight Philippe de Mazières, on a reconnaissance mission locating English strongholds along the northern coast of France, noted in his journal that herring are so plenty that one can get a good catch with one sword. As from the 13th century, Dutch fishermen prepared herring directly on board their boat. After mooring, the catch was stored in small barrels between compact layers of salt. This was known as packed, preserved herring. Fish, together with many other produce, could now be preserved for more than a year and be transported across Europe. Towards the end of the Middle Ages, herring was dethroned by cod, which also fetched more money at the market. As for butchery, all cuts were finished before warm weather. Bovine was strictly reserved for milk production or ploughing. Only pig, young goats, lambs, sure sources of fresh meat were thought fit for consumption. Most of us believe that people in the Middle Ages had to make do with rotting meat and that spices were added to mask the disagreeable taste. In fact, only fresh meat was sold. Bills of payments of the time to butchers have been found in northern and Mediterranean towns. Clauses on delivery times are clearly inscribed. Such meat would seem inedible to our palate. We would find it much too fresh, not cured enough. At the time, the habit was to kill the animal at the point of sale, before the eyes of all then sell the cuts as quickly as possible, by the end of the following day at most. Once the meat was purchased, in cash or by credit, using a small mark on a large twig, an ancestor of our credit cards, the butcher used various methods to preserve his goods. The final precaution taken was in the kitchen. As soon as the meat was covered by a sticky microbial layer, it was judged that conservation could last no longer. 
À ce moment-là, on juge qu'on peut pas aller plus loin dans la conservation. Meat was plunged in boiling water. All recipes at the time quote this. Whether meat was to be roasted, fried or stir-fried, it had to be boiled first. And perhaps this cooking process was a precursor to our blanching. We plunge meat into boiling water to clean it before proceeding with the recipe. Sanitary measures concerning the food trades in the Middle Ages coincided with the birth of the term consumer. Towards the middle of the 13th century, towns and cities became increasingly populated. Citizens no longer knew the source of the produce on sale. Progressively, they became consumers, and particularly avid consumers, of pig. Pig on a spit and stuffed piglets became centerpieces on the tables of aristocrats. Allah is good in pig, our ancestors said, but not at all moments. The Christian calendar regulated pig rearing periods. Slaughtering was allowed between All Saints and Shrove Tuesday, simply because the absence of flies during these winter months made conservation surer. We return to the kitchen of our castle. Squire Martin forbids his kitchen staff to jest, to pilfer morsels as they prepare the dishes. He knows he did just this when he was in charge of the bellows, studying the art of cookery under his master, Guillaume de Tyrell, alias Taillevon. Martin learned that one had to accept the trying conditions of the kitchen if the goal was to earn the blazon of the three pots and become master squire in the kitchens of King Charles V. And Squire Martin has yet to follow his master's genial example and compile a book on the art and tradition of cookery from the 13th and the 14th centuries. It was the first time in history that a master chef had put his pen to registering the culinary art. Before this, stretching back to antiquity, only authors of gastronomy had penned the secrets of cooking. This innovation of the Middle Ages became a bestseller throughout Western Europe. The Viandier of Taiwan cookbook would be published up to the middle of the 17th century. Initially printed in the early 14th century, its popularity would be the envy of many chefs today. Following his master's example, Squire Martin orders his cooks to use only the best sorrel and extract the juice to make an acidulated condiment. This was present in the majority of dishes of the time. Prior to preparation, delicate hands pick up the lusticum, egromwan, or horseradish. Many of these plants are ignored or considered as weeds today. Dice, crush, press for juice. Squire Martin treasures the acidulated flavor of sorrel juice. This will give savor to his special dish, pig chowder. Sorrel juice was an essential element of medieval cookery. Other substitutes were juice from unripe fruit, such as grapes, collected a good month before the harvest, or even apples, pears, and prunes. On all
small tables of medieval Europe, spices were arrayed. They were regarded as a condiment to dishes and as medicine. Three quarters of all dishes were sprinkled with them. This was a result of the influence of the Islamic Empire throughout medieval Europe. The 200 years of crusades to protect, then reclaim Jerusalem, opened multiple roads towards the Middle East and to the heart of Central Asia. Passing through Constantinople, the spice trade route converged with the Silk Route. They led to India and China. While valiant knights, soldiers of the true faith, were being killed in the Holy Land, European merchants peacefully confronted traders from the Middle East. Here, over a game of chess. Hoping to conclude a good trade, this Christian merchant from Venice meets with his counterpart Turkmeni in his yurt to discover, then negotiate the price of the many treasures laid out on a low table. During the Crusades, Europeans were seduced by spices, spices such as cinnamon, nutmeg, mace, ginger, and cardamom seeds, black pepper, long black pepper, small to large varieties of pepper, and of course cloves, galangal, which came from the Far East. Medieval recipes abounded in aromas and spicy tastes. The presentation of dishes was extremely important. The influence of oriental cuisine and feasting rites not only spread to the consumption of sugarcane, bananas and rice. A host of new recipes such as puff pastry and crystallized fruit found their way to tables across Europe thanks to traders from the Islamic world. Passion for spices reached a high at the eve of the Hundred Years' War, which was sparked by rivalry between the English and French royalties. Army cooks took great care to prepare recipes to stimulate the knights. Mixtures of spices with honey were believed to give additional strength by activating blood circulation. These enthusiasts of the Middle Ages and chivalry are reconstituting events of the evening of October 24, 1415, just before the Battle of Azincourt. Like their ancestors, they've taken their vital dose of spicy drugs before the fray. Having donned the attire of the Dukes of Bar or Alençon, these modern-day knights sprinkle huge doses of pepper on their food, expecting to accrue the strength and courage needed to beat back the English out of France. They will respect the fate that awaited the French knights at Azincourt during their enactment. They fell under a torrent of arrows and confusion wrought by English archers. Enthusiasts from across Europe relived the terrible battle. History books tell us that the English, heavily outnumbered, were perfidious and broke with the code of knighthood and used bowmen to counter the French knights instead of using the traditional cavalry and infantry. The French knights fell into total confusion in muddy ground and were massacred by the hatchet and billhookmen of Henry V, who feared a counterattack. But history books rarely mention that the French promptly avenged themselves. They in turn surprised, then massacred Henry V's rear guard and seized all their reserves of spices. Mm -hmm. 
Many citizens died early and violently in the Middle Ages. But people knew how to live to the full, combining palatal and bodily pleasures. More fortunate citizens in the Middle Ages enjoyed private steam rooms influenced by Oriental hammams. These were particularly sought out by lovers. Couples immersed themselves waist-deep in a tub of hot water, while attendants, proud members of a guild, bathed them and offered them delicacies and wine. No ordinary wine, moreover, but posset. Warm wine mixed with curdled milk, famed for its virtues as an aphrodisiac. In time, posset and delicacies was not the only temptation shared by bathers. <laughs> Fasting during Lent meant not only abstinence with regard to certain foods, but also sexual relationships. Today, most people forget or ignore such precepts. In those times, all sexual relations were clearly prohibited. The link between eating habits and sex became central to medieval society. The motivation for this is clear. There are two main physical pleasures. One leads to the other. The Middle Ages was not a period of prudishness. Certain miniature paintings prove this. We can make out couples embracing, giving in to the total pleasure of the senses. Such libertine practices became common with the spread of public steam rooms. But they soon turned into organized prostitution. It was not until the end of the 15th century that such Dionysian activities of feasting and orgies were prohibited, at least in public. When gourmandizing did not rhyme with lovemaking, Abundance was accepted at the dining table in castles. The prestige of the host was measured by the quality, variety and quantity of meat served. Hunting remained the prerogative of the gentry. Game became a question of personal choice. As the Middle Ages evolved, so did the palate of the nobles. There was a change from what was standard three or four centuries earlier at the time of Charlemagne. The eating habits of nobles of that period targeted large animals such as stag, wild boar, deer and even bears. The fattier the meat, the larger the animal was the choice of the nobles at the time of Charlemagne. The size of victuals symbolized the force of the warrior in the man. Treatises on regiments stated that size meant nutritive force. Fowl was eventually regarded as a lighter and more refined meat. In the course of the 13th and 14th centuries, fowl became the most coveted meat, superseding bear meat or wild boar. Regimens had changed. The gentry sought a different social image. We no longer had a nobility of warriors, but one of courtly love and mores, sensitive diplomats and politicians. Eating habits forged a new identity. Peacocks, pheasants, swans, or doves, almost anything that flew, food that was closer to heaven, was reserved for truly noble stomachs. Nobles in Florence or Siena set the example of cookery and table manners well before their counterparts across Europe. Towards the middle of the 14th century, under the influence of art, architecture, and increasing commerce with the Orient, Tuscany led the way a century before the rest of Europe by being home 
to the Renaissance. In Bavania, a town lying between Florence and Rome, enthusiasts reconstitute banquets of the period each year. There are no limits to preparing winged menus. Fowl is brought to the table, sometimes cooked, sometimes alive, sometimes baked in a souffle. Magnificent birds, emblems of power, they offer diners a feast of celestial inspiration. In the kitchens of Colombier Castle in the Aveyron department of France in the 14th century, the menu for Olmeric de Panou's banquet is a little less refined than that of his Italian neighbors, but not necessarily less appetizing. Minutes before serving begins, the announcing bell is rung. Everything must be ready at the given time since the custom of banqueting was to serve all dishes at the one go. The final touch is Squire Martin's famous dish of pig chowder. The bellows worker has already fried a few pounds of sausages in lard. They should now be liberally doused with wine, 80 centiliters per pound of sausages. Claret, sweet and light, blended with honey, is used for this. The dish is left to simmer for some 20 minutes on a low flame. The vegetable cook has crushed two pinches of ginger, pepper and saffron and mixed them with breadcrumbs. This subtle thickener is added at the end of the simmering phase. Squire Martin supervises the exact dosage of his precious juice, the key to his secret recipe. One minute before serving, he must now incorporate two egg yolks while stirring constantly. For the feast this evening, Squire Martin has put all his art into the preparation. Pig chowder fills the castle with its special aroma. Martin hopes to be awarded at least the two cauldron coat of arms on his way to being ennobled. Seven centuries later, the heritage of the squires lives on. At the famous Grand Véfour restaurant in Paris, a modern-day master chef, Guy Martin, confirms his boundless admiration of Squire Chicard, another major chef of the Middle Ages. Like Martin, Chicard was also from the Savoy region and was in the service of Prince Amadei VIII. Squire Chicard's legacy is reflected by the menu of this coveted Parisian restaurant. We can find Rosiol of Pig, prepared in the tradition of the great squire. For the recipe you need spare ribs, cinnamon, figs, prunes, dates, ginger and pine cone seeds. The restaurant has been awarded three stars, but Guy Martin remains modest. Reverent to his past master, squire to the Prince of Savoy in the early 15th century. The innovative genius of Squire Chicard was in the dosage. You have a recipe and you have an economy of ingredients. The technical term, 30 grams of this, 50 grams of that. But beyond dosing, he became a reference in his time. His principles allow anyone to follow a recipe at home. He also believed in divine inspiration. To attain beauty, a cook uses only pick-of-the-crop ingredients to achieve perfection. His cookbook was a sensation. Maître Chicard inspired me with his notion of divine inspiration, of forging beauty out of food. He remains a reference for dedicated cooks. His legacy brings out the best in us. We can explore and experiment with recipes and ingredients. We can put philosophy into preparation. Guy Martin, master chef, maintains that Squire Chicard, author of a cookbook dating from 1420, had understood the secret of haute cuisine.
This roseole of pig reveals his genius, and it's very modern. He used fresh regional produce, like insisting on chicken from Bress. And here we are using pork. He devised rapid delivery services. He surprises our palate with a subtle use of spices. His preparation is flawless, inspirational. His creativity is total, an association of ingredients used to making his recipe so special, yet totally modern. To ensure that his roseole of pig would be fit for a prince, Guy Martin decorates it with gold leaf, just like Squire Chicard did. Gold was believed to make women beautiful, and it induced longevity. It was the produce of the Philosopher's Stone. In the Middle Ages, precious stones were used like ingredients to a recipe. In this recipe, dating from 1420, we dabble with the source of culinary alchemy. Medieval cooking practices evolved under the influence of the Renaissance. Kitchens of the Renaissance period would adopt savors from every horizon, stretching to the Far East. Cookery books would break free of the ascetic rules of the church. Sugar would be used abundantly. People discovered pasta using small forks of two teeth to eat with. But the legacy of past masters such as Taivon, Squires Chica and Martin, and many others, lived on. Without such creators, our taste sensations would never have been the same. <laughs>